Welcome, everybody, to episode two of Controllers Up, Cards Down, the all-star gaming podcast. I am one-fourth of your hosting team this evening, Mr. Scott Crawford, coming to you from Swartz Creek, Michigan. And with me, as always, is... Heather Powell, coming to you from Waterdown, Ontario, Canada. And with us this evening are two lovely co-hosts. I'll bring in Sander Kane first. You may know him from the Cemetery Gates podcast, as well as he's been on our show, Friday Nightmares, as well. He's written every article that probably could be out there for reviews of movies and is like (laughs) in the know. He's actually writing the new search in the search of darkness because he thought the last one was not dark enough. (laughs) Welcome. Sander Kane, how are you today? Hey, I am great. Thank you guys so much for having me uh, on the show. It is much appreciated, and I can't wait to talk about game, all things games with you guys. Uh, so thanks yeah. again. Well, thanks for being here. No problem. And coming in, now this guy is like the king of podcasting, the king of Skype. So he's kind of cheating on it, Skype right now, because he's using Zoom. But we won't tell Skype about it. <laughs> this He comes from No More Room in Hell, as well as Fresh Cuts, as well as Burning for Springwood, as well as Dream Warriors. He is Mike Merriman. What's going on, Mike? Or Mike can't hear us. What's up? I managed is. to weasel my way onto another show. So <laughs> it's so nice yeah, to I managed have to here. sneak my way onto another show. Glad to be here. Awesome. 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 Thank you. I'm glad to be here. And you, I didn't know that you played video games. You still play video games with your kids, Mike? Yeah, uh, actually these days, primarily that's who I'm playing video games with when I have the time it's them begging me to play. So, you know, what are you going to do? That's parent duties, right? So is your game Grand Theft Auto? Is that the game that you like to play? <laughs> it totally should be. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I started them off with San, San Andreas, right? <laughs> so you can get the California layout on <laughs> Right? Absolutely. Um, well, that's got to take yeah, us a bit. It teaches them geography. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I like that. That's funny. Uh, but yeah, I guess uh, since we're kind of in our first little segment here and uh, we introduce our guests, um, we're going to kind of uh, just get a little bit of a history of gaming with both of you guys. Like, where did you both like start gaming and like, what do you like doing gaming wise? So we'll start with Xander. Um, how about you, sir? Uh, yeah, so I, I mean, I like anything games realistically i've been playing them since i was a kid like the first board game that i played that wasn't like um you know candy land or something like that as a kid was like axis and allies and that really got me like oh, nice um the whole strategy of that like really just like drew me in and like consumed me as a kid like we would spend you know we'd have friends over for dinner and we'd play it through the whole night we would play axis and allies and i just thought it was the greatest thing ever and that eventually like translated into some PC games, like um, some RTS games, like Command and Conquer and stuff like that. So that got me into, you know, that Axis and Allies got me into that avenue of PC games. And then we started delving into like MMO uh, games, which one of the games we first started playing when I was a kid was called Meridian 59. And it was like the first um, MMO before like EverQuest and uh world of warcraft and all that and it was just like the coolest thing to me because you could like join guilds and like create feuds with people and other guilds it was like hanging out with people in your neighborhood on the computer and you could get mad at them for looting your friend and then you would challenge them to a duel online and it was like so fucking cool as a kid like i absolutely (laughs) loved it and all that stuff just kept you know it all grew through you know my youth and then eventually went into like playstation um and xbox and nintendo and i pretty much fell exclusively in love with PlayStation titles and I've been a PlayStation guy you know at this point decades now that I'll show my age a little bit but that's totally fine uh, but yeah I'm willing to play like almost any type of tabletop game if there's fun to be had I'm here for it I like the social aspect of playing tabletop games and Dungeons and Dragons I absolutely love um, don't get to play that as much as we want because it just requires a dedicated group a lot of the time and it's hard to fit it in but I'd love to do one shots all the time um so you know hopefully post covid i can get back to some board games and back to some uh, dungeons and dragons again so 
I, you know, it's just, it's just a great avenue to talk and inter interact with people. And I just absolutely love the social aspect of, of gaming, which is kind of weird on the video game side now, like for PlayStation, I pretty much just play single player stuff. Like yeah, I don't, I don't, don't mess with online stuff for whatever reasons. I think I just like the person to person contact a little more. Cause I guess I can only be yelled at from by eight year olds for so long before it really <laughs> starts to like crush my self-esteem. Uh, so <laughs> Yeah, so I typically do the, the, you know, I like story-driven games more so on uh, video games, you know, stuff like uh, Beyond Two Souls, Detroit Becoming Human, uh, anything like that. I really, really like. I gravitate to the, the Telltale games, uh, Walking Dead. They nice. Did, uh, Back to the Future one, that was really cool. They did a Jurassic Park one that was okay. Uh, but I just like those story-driven games. It really, like, grabs me in. I like to be put in situations in video games that I would never find myself in in real life, right? Uh, yeah so i understand my, that's how i do it too yeah so in short that's kind of my gaming history i guess so awesome yeah i'll say like yeah I, I knew like that was one reason we had to have you on because you have like experience kind of like me you're kind of a jack of all trades when it comes to games of all sorts like i play everything as well yeah absolutely and uh mike how about you what was uh your history and like what type of stuff do you like to game with now All right. Well, since we're showing off our age with this answer, um, <laughs> does everyone remember Commodore 64s? Oh, hell yes. <laughs> I started with, a, yeah, I started, I mean, as far as video games go, the earliest I can remember is I had a Commodore 64. I remember I had a, a video game version of Double Dare, the game show. Nice. Um, I had some type of like ninja game where all I, the only memory I have of that ninja game is you would get to the end of like your screen and the ninja would like jump up through the floor to the next level. Um, I think I had like a version of Frogger on it. And, you know, it was a Commodore 64. So it was only going to play so much. I mean, by those standards, I guess it was like good technology. But from there, let's see. I had... Yeah, this is, I think 1989 is when I got a Nintendo and I asked that that pretty much convinced me they were never going to buy me one. So when I opened it on that Christmas, it was like the greatest day of my life. And that memory still stands out because I was in such disbelief that they actually bought it for me. They had me convinced because I had plenty of friends that had it. So like, you know, I'd go to their houses to play but my parents just did that number on me where, yeah, you're not going to get so uh, from <laughs> Nintendo. <laughs> I had a super Nintendo. I want to say I didn't have an N64, but I had friends that did. Uh, I kind of like slowed down until the original PlayStation came out. And then I was all about that with like Metal Gear Solid and the Resident Evil game, oh, yeah. early Resident Evil games. And then pretty much pretty much i've been a playstation guy too just because um the playstation always had something else besides just gaming to appeal like the ps3 was my first and only blu-ray player i've ever bought and luckily yep. i still have a working ps3 to this day um ps4 i have and today <laughs> what a coincidence my ps5 showed up in the mail oh, so perfect. now i officially have my first 4k player because that you know i didn't buy a standalone 4k until ps5 came out so um other than you know video games themselves i grew up playing board games uh you know what's funny is we had you remember the game risk yeah um we had that, and I remember playing it, but I don't think I've ever played a game of Risk according to the actual rules. I think we were so young, we didn't really understand how to play it, so we, we came up with our own method of, like, like rolling the dice to, like, decide who is going to conquer countries and stuff. Um, House rules clues, are the best rules. Sorry. <laughs> I had a lot of Simpsons editions of stuff. And uh, I had a Freddy versus... <laughs> yes. <laughs> I had and that I too. Had actually, versus Jason Killer trivia that I could play with nobody when I was growing up because nobody knew enough about it to even play against me, and right. so it it sits in my closet to this day. Yeah, I actually. <laughs> um, and then, as far mine. as the type of video games, yeah, yeah. As far as the type of video games, all I like all sorts of different ones. I tend to not be such a multi online multiplayer anymore unless it's co op, just because. 
Part of it's the same answer. I don't like getting yelled at by kids. And I just don't have the time to put into the skill level you need to be able to compete. Like I, I've uh, Modern Warfare 1 and 2 was kind of my era when I was doing like to get home from work, log on about 10 at night and play through the night. But, you know, as I got older, married, kids, I just I don't have the time to do it. Uh, and my skill level shows when I just would get murdered so much right. and it stopped being fun. So I tended to flock to uh, just single player campaigns. Uh, the Uncharted games are some of my favorite. La- uh, Last of Us, excellent. Uh, the GTA games, great. And uh, I, I, I've been really getting into uh, modern, I don't even know what the term is. It's like modern retro gaming it's almost like you know 16-bit era style games but yes kind of remastered and remodeled current graphics Uh, i've been really getting into that stuff you know it's it's like part nostalgia but still offering you something new because i actually kind of am i uh, i'm not into uh, old games as much as i thought because the nostalgia would run out and i'm talking about like when you actually would buy like the actual like eight bit or 16 bit versions of games. I thought like, Oh, I'm going to go play like Mega Man. Like I did when I was a kid and a half hour into it. I'm like, I suck now. Like yeah. how did I even beat this? When I was <laughs> like this is so broken. How did I play this at eight years old? You yeah. Your- especially. Oh man. That, those PS2 era games. Now the way the controls are just wooden and it's very tanky. It's like, how did we do it? But at the time we didn't know any better. Yeah, and I was saying we didn't have uh, um, disposable yeah. income either, so there was a lot of like times you just buy one game and go, oh, I'm stuck with this for probably at least a couple months. <laughs> well, and I don't think games came out as quickly, right? I think yeah. you were looking now. There's, yeah. I was actually thinking of that today as we were watching one of the parts of our show and just how far we've come with game manufacturing and now how many even, you know, because I work in post-secondary mm-hmm. university and college programs are for video game design and how many options there are for video games. And now you've got virtual reality. Like you have so much stuff to choose from and you got to be competitive. There's a new game, like what, every week, Scott, would you say? Like, Oh, there's, there's probably at least 20 new games a week. Right. So it's, it's, you know, it's one of those things, right? So when we were kids, like, Mm -hmm. you know, you got what you got and you fucking stuck it out. That's that how it. I ended up playing Echo the Dolphin forever, which have <laughs> even one of you beat Echo the Dolphin? My goal no. is to one day find someone who has. I have the patience for that one. <laughs> Echo. What about you? Yeah, I, was like, yeah I, I didn't, I never had it when it first came out, but one of the computers I bought through the years, I mean, this is now, it's probably like 20 years ago. It came with like a version of Echo the Dolphin on it. And I would try to get into it, and I was just like, there's not enough really going on in this game to keep me <laughs> playing it. So I would it's just difficult. Stopped. No, so mm-hmm. future guests, I want to find somebody that beat Echo the Dolphin. I, there's got to be someone out there that did it. That's my so for a unicorn, this, I tell maybe you. Maybe literally beat Echo the Dolphin. Yeah, like beat. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's what I want to know. <laughs> so what you're saying is this should be one of the questions we ask every guest now coming forward. Yeah, moving forward. That's how you get on the show. These were the yeah. only two guys that got on. Do you want to be a guest? Have you played Echo, Echo the Dolphin? Dolphin nope. Have you beat it? <laughs> <laughs> you haven't? Forget it. We don't care about anything else. That's it. <laughs> but yeah, thank you guys for uh, sharing that. Because yeah, like I. I mean, we're, we've all grown up in that er- in the era where gaming was just becoming popular. So it's just that, like, at least in the video game world, obviously yeah. the well, other games and it, stuff. But yeah, the tabletop games come the same way. Like uh, Wing years Commander, and years ago, man. Wing Commander, one of the first games I played that used actual cutscenes. Yeah. Oh, for sure. Yeah, but tabletop games years ago, they'd only have like eight games come out a year. Mm-hmm. And now we have literally, you know, there's eight that come out on Kickstarter every week now at a minimum. So like you go to Kickstarter page, there's 500 coming out. It's absolutely insane. So we, it's almost too much, you know, at your fingertips. I mean, it's a great problem to have, but like, you know, as uh, if you collect board games or even like, you know, physical video games, like space is a problem when there's <laughs> yeah. so much out there and even hard drive space is a problem right like you have limited space that you can put on your playstation your xboxes your hard, dr- hard drives in general mm-hmm. like got to be selective True. yeah now that we're older it's like yeah, i've already yeah. become a lot more selective than i used to be 
e- even the even the disc version of games, the way they want you to preload like a hundred gigabytes, it's just like damn. Like I thought I was going to save all this space by getting the disc drive version. It's like no, you still got to put all this storage yeah. onto the hard drive. Yeah. Yeah, it's going to be eating it up really fast, especially with the new generation. Um, but, um, I have a quick question before we get to Nate's oh, yeah. thought, because we talked about this with Tim, and I want to give Sander and uh, Mike both a chance to comment on it. It doesn't have to be long, but are do you guys think physical media is here to stay when it comes to video games, or is it going to be digital moving forward? Because as we all know, there is an option to just buy a digital PS5 where you don't buy physical games anymore. So we'll go with Sander first. What do you think? Uh, for me personally, in my space, I think the, I, I love my physical media. I love having my board games. I absolutely adore having my movies. Um, and video games is the one section that I'm willing to bend to go to digital. Uh, just because I live in a small space in the city and I, I just I can't have 9,000 of everything. So that's the one that I'm willing to give digitally. And I was never a person to really loan out my games to anyone anyways. And I never bought used games from GameStop ever um, just because I always hated how they did business. So I just kind of, that was never an option for me. So for me, like I didn't give my games to anyone. I didn't sell my games to anyone. And I just think it's easier for people to, to get it digitally day one. Like, I mean, a kid's rather a kid that's obsessing over a game right now that drops at midnight, they'll sit on their computer and download it immediately at midnight rather than hop in their car and go to a GameStop or wherever it may be. I just, I just think it's, um, for me, it's just, I'm willing to just go digital on, on games. And like, as far as having the PlayStation, all your purchases are stored in the cloud. You can back that up on another hard drive yourself. It's all there tied to your info. So I feel, I feel pretty comfortable switching digitally with games. So I think it's gonna, we're gonna keep seeing that. So I don't, especially with the PlayStation, you know, giving you an option now of going straight digital or hard drive. Hey, you can save a hundred bucks if you go digital. That's pretty appealing for a 16 year old kid. That's probably washing dishes at a restaurant whose, whose money is, uh, you know, pretty thin. If he can save a hundred bucks, he's going to get the cheaper one. So. Yeah. I know it's pretty affordable for my friends who need to save money because I got kids <laughs> that's that too. <laughs> chose to go digital. Uh, what do you think, Mike? All right. So I am kind of, on both sides of this one when it comes to like the i guess they call it a or triple a titles like the big really pieces i tend to go physical because i like to save as much space on the hard drive for um like the either the indie games or like i was talking about like the retro remasters of old stuff that you can't get on disc and i also i'm pretty much a person that Once I beat the game, I'm done with it. Uh, Now, there are exceptions, like, you know, something like a GTA game. You can beat the storyline, but there's so much in that game to keep you entertained beyond uh, just the storyline. But for the most part, like a game like an Uncharted game, it's fun as hell. But once you're done with the story, unless you're really into, like, treasure hunting for every little, you know, thing in the game, I'm done with the game. I'm ready to get rid of it now GameStop obviously is pretty horrible at the trading value they give you so yeah. I'm not like trying to rep their business but hey 20 bucks is still 20 bucks I can use towards another game so in the end they sucker me into <laughs> using them anyway but uh so yeah I, I I'm I would say I still would like the option for physical media uh, mostly for storage reasons you know if if PlayStation 5 had like a 50 terabyte hard drive, maybe that'd be different because I would have zero worries about filling it up. But I mean, for being a two, for being a system that was released in 2020 to only be like a one terabyte drive, I think that was the one disappointing aspect of this next gen console. So I'm still kind of, I still want the option for physical media. Yep. I'm kind of right there with you. That's kind of like my thoughts as well. But uh, yeah, um, I'll say, I guess we can kind of just jump into the gaming news and releases. Um, I'm only grabbing two news pieces that kind of caught my eye. They're both uh, PlayStation related. Uh, let's see. Uh, for The first one was uh, PlayStation has 
announced something called the stay at home initiative that started last year around this time when the pandemic hit to encourage everyone to stay home. But starting March 25th, you'll be able to download and enjoy the following PS4 titles for free. And that is Abzu, Enter the Gungeon, Res Infinite, Subnautica, and The Witness. Uh, there's also four PSVR games that will also be available for free. Astrobot, Rescue Mission, Moss, Thumper, and Paper Beast. And all nine of these games will be free until the 22nd of April, 2021. So if you download them during that time period, they're yours forever. Um, and last but certainly not least, is starting April 19th, uh, you'll be able to nab the PS4 exclusive Horizon Zero Dawn for free, and it will be available until May 14th, and it's the complete edition, which includes the Frozen Wilds expansion. And yeah, I just think, I think that's really freaking cool that the PlayStation is doing this to just kind of encourage people to like stay home more and like, and like just saying, hey, here's a ton of our games for free. Just, you know, enjoy yourself, stay home, play some games. And the fact that they're giving away Horizon Zero Dawn, which is one of their prolific big games. For, yeah, yeah that's beautiful, beautiful game. Absolutely beautiful. Yeah, so I was impressed when they offered that they're offering the whole expansion pack version of that too. Like that's really freaking cool because that game is amazing. I was going to ask, are these quality games? Because I know nothing. So I'm um, glad to hear that they are. They're not just like the shit games that they're like, yeah, yeah, we'll release these pieces of garbage. Nope, every <laughs> one of these games, I have played, I think, uh, seven of these games. And most of them are indie games, but they are yeah. really amazing games. Awesome. I remember Subnautical being pretty fun. Yeah, that one I've lost 50, 60 hours in at least and still never got anywhere in that game. So it was just <laughs> yeah. so Damn. Oh, no. <laughs> just a lot to do in it. But yeah, I thought that I, was just I, really I just cool. like the idea. I, I I just love the idea that gamers need extra incentive to stay inside and never go out. <laughs> right. Isn't that kind of the stereotype already? <laughs> right. <laughs> but, but in all seriousness, no, that is cool that they're offering like free games because uh, this is a, probably what on top of the uh, what, is it the PSN Plus, Plus account yep. monthly free games anyway? Yeah. Yeah, because yeah, those they're still offering those four like three to four games free plus these ten on top of that. So yeah, you there's a lot of uh, bang for your buck in this month. That is for sure. Yeah. And it's probably mm -hmm. meant to get people like me, right, who don't play tons of games, but if I know something's for free, I'll probably go on and play it and and maybe be less likely to go out to the bar and play that <laughs> game. Uh, maybe. So think, maybe or you're just like oh, I'll, cut my, I'll cut my night at the bar an hour shorter so i can go right. home and play the game <laughs> when i'm nice and buzzed absolutely so i can go home load up the game and by the time it loads i go to sleep that's right that's right <laughs> true story um, <laughs> did you have any other news scott or was that it, yep. it's a slow time or oh, okay. uh, nope i have one more this one is kind of a bummer but i kind of seen it coming but uh playstation 3 PlayStation Portable and PlayStation Vita digital stores are shutting down by the end of summer. You will still be able to download the games you have already purchased, but will not be able to buy and download any other games that you don't already own by the time summer wraps up, which, you know, it's a, it's an end of an era with those consoles. So I can understand why PlayStation is kind of getting ready to shut down the store. But at the same time, like it does kind of suck for the ones that, don't have any newer generation systems that are just wanting to still buy some of the indie gems off there. It's like, well, you guys have until summer, they haven't given a specific date yet, but yep, these stores will be shutting down forever, but they are letting you, you know, the games you buy will be yours and you won't yeah, have to worry about that. Go load up on them. If you got yeah. anything in there, yeah, absolutely can't live without for sure. Yeah. Yeah. But I get it. It I, costs money to yeah. keep all those stores open. Yeah. I, I, I think I have like maybe two or three actual physical PS3 games sitting around, but the the console itself is loaded up with like games I've downloaded. And I, you know, with the PS5 coming out, I was kind of ex expecting this with the PS3. My only hope is like, please keep uh, working on firmware updates just for like the the streaming apps on there, you know, like Netflix and all that stuff, because. Uh, my wife's asking me to throw the PS3 in the bedroom, just kind of have like an extra backup streaming machine. So I'm like, okay, as long as like all the other stuff on the PS3, like basically using it as like a media server, even if we're not doing much gaming on it, I'll, I'll still 
put, put the uh, PS3 to plenty of use, but but yeah, you know, it's it's been so long, it, it's kind of expected because I think Nintendo did something similar recently with like uh, older generation. I think it was like Wii U or something that they yeah. were starting to like shut down. Yep, yeah, the Wii and the Wii U stores I think ended up getting shut down. Like, uh, and you know, the same thing, you know, you're able to keep the games that you had, but you weren't able to buy anything new. I I had a Wii, but I never had a Wii U. I kind of skipped that one. So did I. <laughs> which I'm kind of glad in. in I think a lot of people skipped that. Yeah. So. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Much to Nintendo. I think so too. <laughs> yeah. I think so, yeah. But the Switch is better anyway, so. Oh, it absolutely is. I absolutely love my Switch a thousand times more than I ever thought I would. Like, I'd play the crap out of that thing way more than I thought I did. We only bought it because uh, COVID and Animal Crossing came out, so. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That'll but, do I mean, it. Yeah. I got it, I got it for my kids on, <laughs> what was it, uh, Christmas 2019, and like the whole time, I was like, I knew I was probably going to end up throwing a couple of games on there for myself just because there's so much. But uh, six months into it, I was like, wow, I actually played the Switch quite a lot. There's just <laughs> there's so much on there for everybody. That's that's the beauty of it. And, and they do a good job of pricing stuff digitally, I feel like I love a good like small puzzle game. And there's tons of them on the Switch for like two dollars. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, well, hell, I'll play that for a couple hours and keep me busy. Mm-hmm. And it's just, there's tons of stuff on there. You could kill a few hours with just by, you know, two, three dollars. I mean, I bought a game for 74 cents that I paid, played for like two days. I was like, that's worth it. <laughs> and that's right? smart, right? Keep it cheap. Yeah. So you're likely to get more downloads and you'll make a profit off of it one way or another, right? It's really, yeah. it's clever. It's clever how they price mm-hmm. games. I think it's really smart how you range that price. Um, to get people of all different kind of walks of life, or what you're interested in at the time, what you're yeah. using it for, right? I also love that when you can, on the Switch, you can put stuff in your watch list just to watch it. And as soon as the price drops, they'll email you. Perfect. So yeah, I, just cool. load, I load everything in my wish list that I'm interested in, and then I just wait to see the right price drop. And when it gets, I'll buy it when it gets below $5. And lo and behold, wait a month or so, there it is. Boom. Smart. Yeah, and um. And, you know, that's the only two news pieces I grabbed this time around. Um, you know, I'm, I'm continuously looking to see if there's anything that just kind of pops, but these seem to be like the two big ones that kind of just jumped out, jumped out at me. Uh, but I'm going to jump into the releases. I got a. Uh, All right, Scott. What was that? <laughs> I was going to ask you. I was going to ask you because we were just talking about the Switch. Is the Switch Pro a myth or what? Because every other day I see an article that says like, if the Switch Pro comes out, this is what processor it might have. And I'm like, well, this is so hypothetical. Is there going to be a definitive article saying, yes, there's a Switch Pro and this is what it has? But I've been hearing articles for like six months talking about a potential Switch Pro. But mm-hmm. I have one friend that says, no, it, these are all just clickbait stuff. So I'm like, is that friend, is friend Venom? Is there going to be a Switch yeah. Pro or not? And <laughs> no, <laughs> no, not one of my podcasting friends. Um, he would probably say it a lot more harshly if it was him. <laughs> yeah, that's so true. He'd be like, what the hell's wrong with you, Mike? <laughs> um, I'm, yeah, sure, I'm sure you guys have like seen these articles once in a while where it's just like talking about possible specs and like, oh, it might be 4K, it might not. And I'm like, I don't want to hear what might. It's like, is it happening or not? Yeah. At, at this how moment, much money is it going to take out of my checking account? That's what I mean. <laughs> yeah. 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 At this moment, I would say, like, I don't see it happening right away. Like, Nintendo is still profiting big time on the Switch. Like, so I don't think they're going to upgrade to a more expensive unit yet. Though, now that the PS5s and the Xbox Series X are out and getting popular, um, Nintendo is going to need to compete with that somehow. So I have a feeling if there is ever going to be a Nintendo yeah. Switch pro it'll be soon like because i do need to compete because nintendo's always seems to yeah be a bit i mean i would say bigger bigger yeah i mean nintendo really is lacking in online capability type of stuff but i gotta be honest i don't really care about like 4k streaming a mario game <laughs> like i do this five and uh, better storage and possibly you know of course a system that works faster is never bad but 
Right. Uh, we'll see. Yeah, I was say you never know. We'll, we'll probably hear more at E3 if there's an E3 this year. Like it might just be all virtual, but we'll see what happens there probably. Um, but mm-hmm. yeah, for now, I'm going to jump into our release dates. I got some board games and some card game release dates and some video game release dates. I kind of narrowed it down a little bit because, good Lord, between the list of all that, we would be here for hours. <laughs> so I'll start off with the board games. And the first one up is... On April 1st, Sticky Cthulhu, which since I'm a Lovecraft fan, I just had to uh, look at that and go, oh, all right. Oh, <laughs> <me> oh. <laughs> uh, April 2nd, uh, Arkham Horror Into the Maelstrom. Uh, April 12th, Tiny Epic Pirates. Uh, April 15th, Drawn to Adventure. April 15th as well, King of Twelve, uh, Masters of the Night, Kids on Broom, Duel of Wands card game. Good Puppers, Polis, the Tea Dragon Society card game, Taco Cat spelled backwards. <laughs> um, then March 23rd, this one I had to put in there because I am the I am the target audience for this. Magic the Gathering Strict Haven finally comes out, and Magic the Gathering's 2021 commander set is gonna be released on April 23rd. And damn right, I will be buying all of that. <laughs> um, then on April 30th, we have Atlantis Rising, Embarcadero, Alice is Missing, and Power Rangers Deck Building Game. So yeah, a decent list of uh, board games. I really didn't know m- many of these. Uh, I was like, so I think I have Alice is Missing. I think. Oh really? Hold on one is second. Is it missing I'm... and you can't find it? <laughs> no, I kickstarted it, but I think that's. I'm gonna be right back. All right, and we'll just go on to the video games while he does that then. Um, but uh, on April 1st for PS4, PS5, Xbox One, Xbox Series S, PC, and Google Stadia, we have Outriders. Uh, Resident Evil 7 coming to Stadia on April 1st. Oddworld Soulstorm is coming out April 6th for PC, PS4, and PS5. Star Wars Republic Commando coming out April 6th for PS4 and Switch. Scarlet Hood and the Wicked Wood, April 8th PC. Uh, Borderlands 3 Director's Cut coming out April 8th on PC, PS5, Xbox Series X, PS4, Xbox One. Saga Frontier Remastered coming out April 15th on PC, PS4, and the Nintendo Switch. MLB The Show 21, April 20th, uh, PS5, Xbox Series X, PS4, and Xbox One. Mask Maker VR, April 20th for PC and PSVR. Humankind, April 22nd uh, for PC and Stadia. Judgment uh, coming out April 23rd, PS5, Xbox Series X, and Stadia. Near Replicant uh, coming out April 23rd, PS4, Xbox One, and PC. Assassin's Creed Valhalla Wrath of the Druids, uh, the expansion, is coming out April 29th on PC, PS5, Xbox Series X, PS4, Stadia, Xbox One, and uh, two on April 30th, and that is new Pokemon Snap coming to Nintendo Switch. And Returnal coming to PS5. And uh, Sander has a special thing that he can do. Tell he is Alice is missing. I have it. So I kickstarted this. Uh, this game, the Kickstarter was like right when COVID was going on, right? And like right before all that happened, I finally found some. Like we moved to the city a couple of years ago and hadn't found a tabletop group immediately. But then my neighbors behind me, we finally started playing games. And of course, COVID happened, so then we didn't play games anymore. But the cool thing about Alice is Missing is a silent RPG game. And the way you communicate is text messaging. It doesn't, really? requ- it doesn't require like a game master, dungeon master, or anything. You're just all trying to share clues collectively through um, texting one another. And there's an actual soundtrack in here that you can play wow. the music so it becomes fully immersive. And you're all trying to solve this mystery of the town and what happened to Alice. Um, it just seemed like a really fucking cool idea. And it was like $17 or something for the Kickstarter. So I was like, oh, wow. Take my wow. money, right? Even if I play it one time, I don't really care, right? Right. Um, but yeah, anyways, it's 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 a pretty darn... I haven't played it yet, to be fair. But it's a really cool concept. And for the price point, it's just something a little different. So I just wanted to plug it. Pretty cool. That's yeah, awesome. that's awesome. Yeah. That's like, kind of convenient that it's coming out and you already got the Kickstarter. That worked out perfectly. It was like <laughs> the best segue ever. Really I was, was like, wait, so Alice is missing. Wait, because I didn't know what it's like. Uh, I didn't 
I mean, I backed on a Kickstarter. I had no idea when the release date was because, you know, who knows? A lot of that stuff on Kickstarter never really gets a mass release. If like a, if a game store backed it during the Kickstarter, they got four or five copies. That's it until mass distribution happens. And a lot of the times there's so many games out there. It doesn't happen. So if they don't snag on a Kickstarter, you don't get it. So, right. Truth. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, I'm going to have to look into that game because that sounds very unique and fun. Yeah. And uh, yeah, so yeah, that's the end of our uh, new segment releases and introductions and whatnot. So we can uh, move on into our uh, next segment. Retro table? Yes. Heather, so, take it away. Welcome to the Canadian retro ta- table where I force people to watch episodes of Video and Arcade Top 10 <laughs> from Canada, which from your our previous episode, if you listened to, uh, was a Canadian television game show that went from 91, 1999 to 2010. And it was sponsored by all the major video game um, organizations or companies that were going on, mainly Nintendo, uh, specifically for this episode. So this episode was released in October of 1999. So Sander and Mike, we'll start with Sander first. What were your thoughts of Video and Arcade Top 10? So obviously this is the first time I'd ever seen this uh, this particular show, uh, but I actually like really, really loved it. So it is... a uh, for anybody that knows like the reference, like it's kind of a blend of attack the show from G4 days, Mm -hmm. uh, which would have been like late two thousands, like 2010s more on there. Uh, It's very much that because it blends in with pop culture stuff. That was very much this because it came first. Fair enough. (laughs) Fair enough. Uh, But it also like felt like this particular episode that we watched felt like a Nintendo power Mm -hmm. thing Uh, because like it was awesome to see So, like, Attack of the Show didn't always give away, like, um, how to do things, you know? Like, here's the move to do this. Uh, It was really cool to see them, like, pop up. Like, they were talking about Banjo and Kazooie and talking about, oh, you can do this if you... And just giving you the secrets and hints, which was really awesome because that's, like, kind of the thing you did with Nintendo Power back in the day. Like, you broke it open just to make sure you could find all those little neat little intricacies. It was really cool to see them, like, give a really fun... um, presentation to that to their audience back in the day and it does feel really chaotic like the show does it's like ah super high speed right "Ah." yeah it's like sensory overload what's going on why is this why is this girl band here singing a song and (laughs) and i'm I'm gonna mail my answer to you so i can win a free cd (laughs) yeah Uh, yeah, no it was cool it was really cool it was fun nostalgic um and lots of good information and i totally forgot about um Excite Bite 64 in this particular episode. Yes. I totally forgot that was a thing. So that was really cool to like go and see a few things that I completely forgot about. Uh, but like definitely it was like totally on the hype train. I could only imagine like being excited to get off the bus to go watch the show when it was on TV. So oh, it, was, it was the shit. Let me and, tell you. Yeah. It's cool that it still exists in form on the internet. So, you yeah. know, sometimes it's a definitely one for the internet. But yeah, I thought it was, it was cool. It's totally dated. With totally the uh, hated, everybody totally. has their stupid nicknames underneath their real names. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and hip that... chick and cool dude and <laughs> and Nicholas Piccolis is not even his real name. <laughs> who is a pretty famous DJ in Canada? Like that guy actually is well known, which is why it's so funny. Most people know who Nicholas Piccolis is <laughs> yep. if you're Canadian. Um, <laughs> Mike, what did you think? Well, I'm. Um, I usually break canadian programming into two categories there's the standard canadian programming and then there's oddly canadian programming (laughs) this one doesn't quite hit oddly canadian maybe because of the time frame in the 90s it just feels very 90s more than Mm -hmm. anything else um i definitely agree it reminds me of like early g4 almost Almost when it was tech TV before it changed into G4. Uh, it reminds me a, a little mix of like an X play where they talk about video games. Uh, and then, of course, you know, giving away like the hints and the tips for playing games kind of reminds me, uh, like uh, Xander said, Nintendo Power. There was a show when I was growing up er- earlier in the 90s, w- like the host was Nintendo, but he would play like a uh, Mario cartoon and some other cart, I maybe like a Mega Man cartoon, but at the end of every episode, he'd like sound for like the hot tip on how to beat this level or something. So it kind of reminded me of like a mix of all that. And, you know, watching it now in retrospect, is kind of like, it comes off as a little corny and chaotic and goofy, but 
I can imagine at the time, you know, I would, you said it started in 99. So I would have been 19, oh, 1991. I mean, if I would have been oh, 91, okay. Yeah. Okay. This yes, episode is from 99. Yes. If I would have been watching it as an 11 year old. Oh, uh, okay. So yeah, if, if I would have been watching it since 91 as a kid, it would have been right up my alley at the time. It would have been something I probably tuned into daily just because you're into gaming, you're going to watch shows about it. And there was no tech TV or G4 back then. So it was probably the closest thing around that would have been like that. So yeah, as a kid, I would have been totally into it. Awesome. Well, in this episode, uh, Nuclear Strike 64 is played. Um, the winner wins not really that great of a prize. I remember, I only remember <laughs> yeah. what the second prize was because he won a system. Uh, so they covered Nuclear Strike 64. They covered, uh, which was a, heli fight, a helicopter fight game, which actually looked really cool. Uh, Banjo Kazooie for, for N64. The musical group Bewitched was. Yeah, I was going to ask, did you know Bewitched? When you were younger? I knew we witch. I, I never heard scale. of them. Is that going to be the outro for this episode? Is that, that is. Bewitch that's song? actually, and it's going to be Scott singing it. That's actually cool. what we're yeah. doing. Be I feel like if there's one of those ear. in every episode that you guys reviewed, whatever song is on that episode of the show should just let you go out of the outro. We should. It's only we fitting. Should, right? That is a good idea, actually. It is a good idea. <laughs> Um, and then there was the, you guys talked about Excite Bite 64. Which I want to jump in real quick. Sure. This is where I had to say I loved, like, because I loved Excite Bite when I was younger. But this is when I was like, yep, this show is totally Canadian because they're telling you how to do the tricks when you're jumping in the air. And they're like, you got to make sure to press the Z button. The Z <laughs> like, button. <laughs> not the Z shit that you guys talk about. All the Canadian kids <laughs> would be like, Z button? Is that a new button on the controller? Um <laughs> WrestleMania 2064. Do you guys have any experience with any of these games that you want to share? The, uh, um, the wrestling one was like a huge deal, if I remember correctly, because yep. it was the first one that had triple, like you could triple tag team. Yeah, they talk about right. a thing. They had yeah. Royal Rumble. That was the first one that had like all these really cool elements. So if you were like a wrestling kid, that one was like the fucking game. When you when you know when you were wanted to play a game where you fought against your friends and stuff like that was the one that everybody yep. loved and it was yeah, also was... four controllers right the sixty four yes. so you had four yeah. so that's what made that one like super super exciting um, I I never played uh, I remember playing Banjo Kazooie but I don't the other ones I didn't have much experience with but the wrestling one was definitely a huge deal yeah because I remember right after high school I would go over to my buddy Jason's house and we would play for hours doing the that WrestleMania wrestling sixty four and we would create characters of our friends and make them just do <laughs> stupid stuff. And then we'd throw them in the Royal Rumble together. And, oh, man, it was just a blast. But it was just, you look at it now and it's going, oh, that's painful to the eyes, the transition to those 3D graphics back yeah. then. But Or just the audience constantly looking like this yes. in the background. <laughs> yes. <laughs> what but about man. you? Sorry, Scott. What about you, Mike? Do you, did you play any of these games? Uh, Banjo Kazooie. I have a little bit experience with this. This era was kind of like when I slow, like I was eight bit, sixteen bit era, thirty two and sixty four bit. I was kind of touch and go. It was more playing what my friends had. Um, Golden Eye, obviously, on N sixty four was a big one. Uh, oh, yeah. The wrestling game we had that we played a bunch was it was WCW. NWO World Tour or Revenge or one wow. of them because the battle royal mode in that game was so fun because you would select your first player but when you got tossed out you would automatically get to take control of the next guy and you could make other wrestlers do other guys taunting them so we would all make wrestlers do all La Parca's dance <laughs> and it, it, it seems so stupid now looking back on it but at the time it was just ridiculously fun and uh but yeah those are mostly what we were playing in that era um, my friend was the one that had like every console that came out no matter what um you know always always buying it on the first day always had games to go with it so whenever there was a time that i skipped console or an era i always had access to play the games but yeah i mean 90s for me is 
Good time, man. That's my coming of age decade. <laughs> that's why you have to have that one rich friend as a kid that got yep. all the systems so you could go over there and play them at their house. And the last three that they talk about here for the video arcade top 10 three of the week were Pokemon Stadium, Tony Hawk Pro Skater. I guess that was for the first one, maybe. Yep, that was the very um, first one. The very first one. And then Kirby 64, uh, the, cur- the Crystal Shards. Um, and then also the movie that came out that month was Superstar. Yeah, uh, Molly Shannon. <laughs> and the one kid won an N64. So that was pretty sick that uh, the one kid that, and his home player won. That's and a good prize. Home player. Yeah. Uh, it was, a, that was a shit. That's why you wanted to be on that show as a kid, because you knew you were going to get the good prizes. Um, and Canada, well, I guess we had a deal with Nintendo. We must have like signed a deal with the devil because we had a theme park in Toronto called Ontario Place and we had Nintendo Tower. So you would go to Nintendo Tower and there would be all these game systems lined up with the latest games and you could try them out. Um, oh, and everything and... was painted like Nintendo. So I think we just signed our life away. To and that, that makes I sense because... Need- even in Niagara, you guys have that uh, Mario Kart uh, golf cart. Oh, yeah, we do. We have the Mario Kart track from N64 now in Niagara Falls. You know, when the border's open, everyone can come and visit yeah. that. Oh, really, really excited That's amazing. I beat my friend last year on it. It was pretty magical. Um, <laughs> but, yeah, so thanks for watching Video Arcade Top 10. Uh, we will wonderful. be post- I'm glad you guys liked it. We'll it be posting good. the episode to our page. It's fun. And we'll be choosing an- another episode next time, maybe from the 2000s. Hell, yeah. Yeah, because I, like, we're getting to the era where I was playing a lot of games when we jump into the newer stuff. Like, I mean, I obviously played the older stuff too, but like the newer stuff is more, more what I'm nostalgic for. Cause I was like, Oh man, I spent 30 hours playing these games. <laughs> like give me that purple discs PS one game. Yes. <laughs> uh, so now we can just jump into our, what we've been playing first impressions, reviews, whatever you'd like to call it. There is really no name. We just kind of go with the flow on this one. <laughs> but uh, Xander, I'll let you uh, kick this off. Cool. Uh, so right now, what I'm playing a lot of is Final Fantasy VII Remake on PlayStation 4 because they it was one of the PlayStation Plus games um, that they put out for free this month, which I was super stoked. I have very, very fond memories of Final Fantasy VII uh, when it came out. Yes. 16, 17, how many ever years ago it was. Very long time um actually it's close to 20 years ago that's like 24 shit. years ago yeah uh like buddy and me and a buddy of mine just basically we got an ice storm and we played final fantasy 7 and gran turismo 3 i think for like the whole weekend that's all we did and i haven't revisited a final fantasy game in length really since then like i played 11 a few times i just couldn't really get into it but this one is a significant uh change of pace in final fantasy 7 it is it is still like turn based but like it moves like super fast right like you can select your characters mid battle and just like bam 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 you can, like the speed of it is absolutely incredible the graphics are way incredible it's the same story uh loosely as final fantasy 7 it's just much more in depth and involved with uh, the city uh migrad or whatever the city's called it just takes a lot more focus in there on that. But, man, it is super fun and slick and just a damn good time. <laughs> now, this is one I've been wanting to play because, I, like I mentioned on the last episode, Final Fantasy VII was the very first game I ever beat. So I have a lot of nostalgia for this game. And now that it's free on PS Plus or for PS Plus, I had to snag it up, and I really look forward to putting time into it. You might be muted, I think. I am muted. For free, uh, I mean, for a free game on PlayStation Plus, it's actually absolutely incredible. Like, there's plenty of hours of gameplay in that game. Yeah, that's awesome. That's only, like, the first of my buddy, parts, My buddy recorded... Uh, I was going to say, my buddy recorded himself on a VHS tape beating Final Fantasy VII because he <laughs> just loved the final boss in that so much that... Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, he's a, awesome. he, he made me watch it <laughs> multiple times. Yeah, check this out. <laughs> that is awesome. Got to make sure to use the Knights of the Round summons. <laughs> um, but yeah, how about you, Mike? What was the game you brought to the table? All right. So I mentioned earlier that I, I've been kind of really getting into kind of like uh, retro I guess it's like new versions of retro games. So there's this one that sort of resembles Contra 
or a contra light game uh, called Hunt Down. Has anyone heard of that here? Uh, it's an indie game that it totally has kind of like the eighties action, like it's kind of scummy aesthetic to it where you're kind of running through these levels with your different kind of weapons, whether you machine gun, flamethrower, a spread type gun, grenades, rocket launchers, and you're going through like, I, I can't remember the name of the city, but you know, it's some drug fueled gang that you're taking out and each so Flint, Michigan? <laughs> uh, yeah i'm sure that's one of the cities in there Definitely. um but like each city has like a different like over the top crazy uh gang uh with of course like a like the level i'm on right now the main boss is like he kind of reminds me of sub-zero not sub-zero from mortal kombat but sub zero from running man the movie oh, um, nice. like the mohawk with the hockey mask sh- shooting a hockey puck grenades at you and you know the the way the dialogues were in it's totally uh 80s trash cinema curse words every other word that they're saying to you uh so it's basically a game meant for as much carnage as possible i think it's like 10 15 bucks on playstation network i'm sure it's on switch too because nice. sometimes i'll look at i'll look at uh both online stores and see where it's cheaper because these types of games they'll run fine on pretty much any system you don't really need to go for the higher specs to run them so there's that and another similar one called bro force which yes bro force it, it pretty fun. much models every action icon from like the 80s um yeah, yeah bro force is is hilarious like if you want yes. to laugh at the carnage the entire time bro force is the game to get uh so those two they've been keeping me happy other than that playing uh new super mario brothers deluxe on the switch with my kids that's kind of their first mario platforming game that they've gotten into and nice. they always want to play with me so i'm more than happy to oblige that's awesome good parent was- time right yeah, and I have to say, I do, I, I yep. definitely recommend Bro Force because yeah, that game is ridiculously fun. <laughs> um, but yeah, Heather, how about you? Well, there was one game that I was going to bring to the table, which was uh, Munchkins, but I didn't get what the fuck was going on in that game. <laughs> so I'm super glad I played something else because I wouldn't even be able to explain it. So I played Settlers of Catan. So this is a board nice. game that runs from anywhere. Would you to- fight by the end of it? Um, we don't want to talk about that. The body's in the backyard. Um, so I said to my girlfriend who brought it over, I'm like, is this like risk? She's like, oh, it's nothing like risk. And as I played it, I'm like, this kind of feels like risk only like kind of different, but people can debate on that. Um, it ranges anywhere between $11.99 to like $20 or more, depending on what pack you want to get. It's average four players can play. It's a combination strategy resource management. You need the right materials to build houses and roads and gain victory points. I kept saying it was a colonizing game just to make my friend upset because it kind of is <laughs> and made her mad. So it was fun. It is. <laughs> um, the, lure, the luck of the die throw drives these resources and determines how many settlements and roads you can build. Um, in which in turn you get more resources so you have resource cards that you can purchase with your resources you have houses you can purchase and roads you can buy i will share a picture to our page later of me playing it and i won i won yes like Good I, for you. I go i made it to 10 points so the you are the settler of Catan. I am. I am. I am the best. Um, as Settlers of Catan, clearly. I, I made it to 10 points. And my poor girlfriend was like, oh my god, you have 10 points. Like She was completely yeah. like, how did this even fucking happen? You didn't understand the rules an hour ago. Uh, <laughs> I she, was, be- she was nice to you and probably traded with you. She, she, well, she wasn't that nice. Because I bought a lot of stuff from the bank. Yeah. Um, I just, I guess I set up, so I kind of had the strategy where I would try to get, you know, sheep where I was missing sheep and rocks where I was missing rocks and, and wheat. And it's actually a really cool game. Once you get the hang of it, I would recommend watching a YouTube video. There's oh, is, yeah. out there and they're really good. Like she was explaining it, but she was all over the place. The YouTube video was really, really good because he breaks down. Okay. This is how you set up the board. Right. This is how <laughs> your first turn looks. This is what you're doing after that. So yeah, I really enjoyed it. And it says on average, it should take you an hour. It took us an hour and a half, but drinks were involved. 
Um, and there was a lot of making fun of each other. So it definitely kind of pulled it out a little bit, but I wasn't exhausted at the end of it. I find with yeah. some games, like I played the game of life a couple of weeks ago and that game's just a little too fucking real now at this age. Like you got to pay for your kids to go to college. You, it must be an American game. Cause I got sued three times throughout that. Entire <laughs> um, definitely American. That doesn't happen here in Canada. No one sues anyone. We all have, loony money no one wants that shit so (laughs) um you know it was like that's fine but by the end of it you're tired i found with sellers of Catan, it was just really easy to play and once you got the rules it was fun to trade and um, we had a good time with it but i know that my girlfriend has played with two other friends of mine that get super competitive and and yeah it's it's a really it could be a really so i love for first and foremost i love sellers of Catan. i think it's a wonderful game uh but the game can get bogged down when people just flat out refuse to negotiate they would rather mm-hmm. lose the game they would rather yeah. everybody have a bad time than them lose the game to you yeah. and it becomes incredibly awful so a lot of people like it just depends on your group of people that you play with right yeah um but there is a version of it called sellers of Catan: the americas i believe is what it's called mm-hmm. and what it does it really circumvents that like if people just want to be jerks and don't want to trade with you, you can just go get it your damn self. It takes a little bit longer, but there's a workaround. So that one, it's a little more in depth. The rules are a little more heavy, um, but it's not crazy uh, amount, but it is kind of a workaround for Catan for people that maybe played Catan and didn't like it. This one, I would say if, if the reason you didn't like it is because people were being difficult and not trading and making it not fun, that version of the game is just as fun. And you can say, screw you, I'll get it myself. So <laughs> I think it's great because we had a good time. There was three of us playing it and it was, it was all jokes. It was all like, neither one of us, none of us cared who won. We were just having a good yeah. time. So it made it really enjoyable, but I could see it being an issue if people didn't negotiate. Oh, yeah. We negotiated and gave each other whatever shit we asked for. We were right. like, we had it, we were given it. Right. Um, but yeah, I really, I really did enjoy it. I thought it was a great tabletop game. So for those of you out there who, you know, don't want to play the game of light for the 18th time or monopoly or risk, this is a really great alternative and it's pretty fairly priced. You can probably pick it up at any game store or online through Amazon if you would like. Yeah, that's uh, it's been a, it's a very fun game. I haven't played it in a very long time, but yeah, it's one that I would like to actually have a game night for again. Yeah. Sure. Um, but yeah, I guess I will jump into uh, what I've been playing. Um, didn't get into my board games yet, but I did uh, pick up Arkham Asylum. So hopefully by the next episode, I will have a chance to like sit down and actually play it and talk about that. But I got a little side sidetracked because Scotty found himself a PS5. And was able to bring the bad boy home. <laughs> and uh, so, of course, all I did was spend tons and tons of time like learning a new system and playing whatever I could on the system. So I got Spider-Man Miles Morales, because uh, that seems to be the go-to suggested game for the PS5 right now. And, oh my God, does this game just look stunning. Zero like like zero load times. It's just like it loads right up like like that. It's instantly. Um, draw distance is insane. It it runs at I think it was I think this runs at uh thirty frames per second, but you can actually have it at a static sixty frames per second if you choose a different option in the game itself. So it's just smooth as butter. Beautiful graphics, like the controls, everything. It's if you played the Spider-Man on PS4, it's that just enhanced even more. And it adds a layer of it with the dual sense controller that is now with the PS5, because the technology inside that controller is insane. Cause like you can just have Spider-Man walking and you feel like the footsteps in the controller. And it like feels like it feels real. Uh, that and, haptic like, even- feedback. Yes, the hectic feedback. Exactly. It's insane. And like uh and I'll jump into this game too, but uh Astrobot uh, Playroom was a game that's on the PS5. It comes automatically with it. I recommend anybody that gets has a PS5 that uh buys one, play this game because it will show you everything that this controller can do. And not only that, but the game is actually a very fun, cute platformer that looks really pretty and shows like the power of the PlayStation 5 as well. But yeah, like the main draw to it is it's like, here's pretty much what this controller can do. And it's insane. I can see why they're charging 70 to $75 
for a controller because there's so much technology in it. Um, and then old man here. Oh, wait. Oh, you're you're gonna love it, Mike. You're gonna love it. But uh, old man here ended up. <laughs> did you did you buy uh, a bundle? No, I'll, kind of yes. I bought it off my friend who bought a bundle. Okay, yeah, I had to get a bundle in order to get it when I did. Yeah, because I think he bought a bundle, but he... Yes, exactly. (laughs) Yeah, because I think he bought a bundle, but he ended up uh, keeping one of the two games that came with it. So, yeah, I'm trying to look into if GameStop... Because I've heard... I've heard so many different answers, whether... So the bundle I got came with three games. I'm keeping the Spider-Man one because the reviews on it are just so excellent, and then you've just backed that up. The other two if I can go to GameStop and do like actual returns on them and get like store credit or cash, I'll return those and maybe turn around and look on the shelves to get something else. But if they won't, then I'll just, you know, I guess I'll keep them and check them out. But um, the Spider-Man one, I'm definitely keeping, I, I can't wait just hearing you talk about it. I'm like, what am I doing here? I should be setting my stuff up. right now. <laughs> yeah. I, just I, it's, <laughs> I don't blame you. I don't blame you at all. (laughs) Um, But there is one more game I wanted to briefly mention because all the cool kids seem to be playing it and old man Scotty dived into it. And that is Fortnite. I had no idea what I was even doing during that game. I was uh, meeting up with some old gaming friends of mine. It was their birthday. So we were like just kind of having like a virtual birthday playing Fortnite together. And I was basically getting carried by the team because I had no clue what I was doing. I was going off and being lone wolf trying to like take on everybody by myself they're going no we got to work as a team stop shooting at the first thing you see scott (laughs) sounds like podcasting with you it kind of is i just kind of just lone wolf just run it (laughs) i don't even know what you're doing anymore yeah just get up and leave (laughs) one one cool thing about that game is it's cross-platform so my kids actually what how it works with our current setup is one will log into it on the ps4 the other on the switch then they hook up with their friends over the network of either one of them and then they get in their own lobby and go into it as a team i thought that was pretty cool um and now that the ps5 is going to be going in the main room with the ps4 off to the side room my daughter no longer has to like uh check with me whether she can turn it on and play because now uh the PS4 will be dedicated in the side room. So she is celebrating the PS5 purchase as much as I am, just for different reasons. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I that I'll say like I, I actually had a lot of fun with that Fortnite game. I see why it is extremely popular. And they are constantly just updating it like and changing it every like several months. They just switch it up and it's like new landscape and like new themes and new things to unlock. So like it's I see why it's been as an addictive, popular game as it is. Like, I could see myself continuing to play it just when I'm just bored and only have like a half hour to play. Oh, right. screw it. I'll throw on a match of Fortnite. Awesome. But yeah. But yeah, that's uh, pretty much what I've been gaming on. And uh, yeah, hopefully next time I will be able to bring a board game to the table to talk about. I'm yeah, excited to try Maybe you'll get more into your magic cards and get back to your pro lifestyle yeah well, it's it's kind of boring to talk about yeah. what we play magic wise like it's just like because we play so many decks in one night like i would be here you, you would be you <laughs> well i know right now heather would probably roll her eyes until she's seen her oh. brain <laughs> <laughs> like because we we would be here for hours if i went hours. into detail hours, hours. <laughs> talking about fireball fireball oh, um hey. I used to play, a, I think I told Scott this, I used to play an old card game called Vampire the Eternal Struggle, Struggle Vitesse. Uh, that was made sounds by, way cooler. It was made by White Wolf, which is the same people that originally made Magic. I don't know if that's still the case. Um, but yeah, it was a super, like, you would build so many decks, like, different. So the way it worked is, like, you had a, a deck that was a certain, like, vampire clan, and then they all, each clan had its own, like, abilities and you could like mix the clans together if they were like same in the in the familiar family like you're kind of friends it's basically like an ally essentially like you have a truce with that clan but you could mix like the decks together and it would get like super crazy like you said you would build like 
I got five different coven decks built into this thing and you can't feed it unless you have like these three specific cards in your entire deck. <laughs> yeah. And I was like, that's kind of like magic. Like there's yeah, just it's like crazy fun. Only yeah. it sounds cooler than magic. Hey, there is a reason magic has been around for about 30 years now, Missy. I know. Yeah. I just like making fun of you, Scott. <laughs> I know you. It wouldn't be a podcast if I didn't insult Scott. Oh, Scott yeah. froze. And then like the most cute position. Uh, but, uh... <laughs> hey, cutie. <laughs> Oh, you froze and you were your eyes were closed. <laughs> it was super cute. Anyway. <laughs> oh dang it! I'll have to see. I'll have to see the video play. Oh, you'll see it. It's really <laughs> adorable. Uh, but yeah, thank you guys for uh, bringing all this to the table with us today, and thank no you for problem. joining us on the show today. Uh, I actually wanted to talk about one oh. tabletop game real quick. No, I totally no, forgot. that's it. Sander you caught me off guard. <laughs> Last yeah. call for games. I'm just Last kidding. call. No, really, I do want to talk about one. I'll make it <laughs> yeah, quick. Of though. course, of course. So, like, I wanted to. This is one of my favorite tabletop games called uh, Letters from Whitechapel. Um, it plays up to five players, and the premise is Jack the Ripper. Uh, and it's old London, and you play – one person plays as Jack the Ripper. The other four play as constables. And the way the game starts is there's, like, crime scenes all around uh, London that get placed there by the player that is Jack the Ripper – and then Jack the Ripper figures out where he's going to hide the body. And then you place the constables and you have to go through all the back alleys of the city as constables. And you're trying to find the trail of all the crimes of Jack the Ripper. And basically, if I was Jack the Ripper, you guys would be going to certain places on the map and you would say, were you here? Were you at, you know, location 73? And me as Jack the Ripper, I have to log every move in my little like notepad to where I am. And if I was in it, I have to tell you, yes, I was. And then you can, that's where this trail starts, right? And then you just kind of follow the trail until you think you find Jack the Ripper. And then you could go to the place and make an arrest. Um, but it's a really cool kind of easy game sure. to play. It, it sounds like a, a modern, cooler, darker version of where in the world is Carmen San Diego. <laughs> it truly yeah. kind of is. So yeah. like, you, um, like it doesn't, like it, the only thing you really need is a person that knows how to play uh, the Jack the Ripper character, because that's like the most important part. But there's plenty of YouTube well, videos to, to do figure that, that out. Um, <laughs> yeah. It's just, it's super fun. I think it's really cool. Jack the Ripper has a few like moves that he can like double jump spaces and use characters to get away. It's just a cool, fun game. It's easy to socialize with people. Doesn't require a ton of thought. Um, you just, you know, you're trying to find the trail. Super fun. Highly, highly recommended. It's a great uh, group game for like five people even with like three people it's still super super fun but you need at least three to play but it's one of my all-time favorite board games you can find it anywhere for probably less than 40 bucks so oh, nice. just check it out if anybody's interested it's awesome that's yeah, really that, cool that sounds like my type of game for one not much thought perfect <laughs> for another it's just like yeah that it's a good price tag for something like that too which is awesome and it kind of blends horror and board games, which don't we yes. all like? We're all horror podcasters at heart, so absolutely. That's why I wanted to bring it up. Yeah, and I'm glad you did. Thank you. And uh, yeah, of course, everyone probably noticed that you know it's been the whole episode without a cat, so Biff had to come in and make an appearance. <laughs> yeah. Okay. yeah. So before we sign off, would either one of you gentlemen will give you a chance to promo your stuff that you do? Um, we'll start with Sander if he's available. If Okay, he's not. We're we'll start with Mike. Um, Mike, <laughs> do you want to talk about where people can find you? All right. Uh, I think you mentioned at the very beginning, No More Room in Hell is the main show. Uh, we That's kind of like the all-encompassing podcast. Uh, news, what we watch, and then we pick a couple movies we're going to talk about. No really rules what they can be other than horror um dark discussions podcast network for that one uh fresh cuts is the companion show to that uh it's strictly new releases on that one it's a weekly show uh next movie we're covering tomorrow is called phobias i don't know much about it nice uh, but just from the title alone i had a guess what it would probably be about <laughs> and what else uh we brought back our monthly show theme warriors which is non-horror specific. It's uh, all genre movies where we decide on a theme and then the four hosts pick a movie that goes with that theme and we discuss them. We just recorded yesterday and it's now up the latest episode where it's uh, movies where either the lead or a prominent actor plays uh, two or more roles in the movie 
So that that's, is also on Dark Discussions. That's out now. And then I believe Heather already mentioned Burning for Springwood, where we uh, take on the task of going over the Freddy's Nightmares series. Mostly so uh, no one else has to because uh, <laughs> most of them are pretty mediocre. But every every few episodes, you run into a good one. And there was one with Brad Pitt in it. So, hey, discoveries all the time, right? Exactly. <laughs> Yeah, we, we were, both Heather and I have been on a couple of your shows, like, I think the only one we haven't been on is Theme Warriors. <laughs> yeah, it's always um, a good time. I love probably, No More yeah. Room in Hell. I love you, Derek, and Venom together, and um, Dawn is now joined Fresh Cuts, and sometimes I haven't listened to Fresh Cuts because of all the new watches I watch now. It's hard to, like, um, I'm worried Venom's gonna, like, tear some of them apart, and I don't want to, like, get mad at him, so I don't listen to some of them. <laughs> <laughs> but I absolutely love all your shows, Mike, yeah. and you you welcome me into the podcasting world there early on so i always have a soft spot for you and your shows yeah you guys are welcome to come back anytime awesome thank you well, thank you and uh mr sander kane where hey can my dog is no longer you? creating mayhem <laughs> he went outside and literally knocked over all the booze off the table oh man no. you were yeah. like what <laughs> <laughs> yeah um anyways uh you can find me at cemetery gates uh podcast we are on podbean and all other streaming services spotify this and that uh it's just me and my buddy android virus and we talk about in most cases we talk about super kind of sleazy weird shitty movies that most people wouldn't even care to watch uh, but sometimes we do newer stuff just because it's our show and we do whatever the hell we want to do so <laughs> the last few episodes have been kind of newer things so this next episode should be uh pretty sleazy so uh, i oh think boy. we're gonna do orgies of sin and uh, a few other a few other pretty sleazy films from the 70s so yeah we just kind of do weird stuff because that's you know that's what we gravitate to and we have a good time with it um but yeah that's the only thing i'm doing right now in the podcast world so well cemetery gates is a really fun show i love how much you guys talk about me all the time i feel like i get yeah. caught up on every other episode i know i'm still kind of jealous that i'm not you invited should be. on <laughs> you see like we have a thing going the three of us that's why and i was a little concerned because last episode was a little classy with some of the movies you were going too over classy. so i'm glad you're going back to some trash because i yeah. didn't know what podcast i was listening to at first. <laughs> yeah well the last one we did hunter hunter and style hunter hunter was a request from another listener and the stylist um, uh, I just wanted to talk about the yeah. episode before that Heather was on and I brought it up. I decided to talk about the stylist in the last second and I did an absolute terrible job talking about the stylist. And I was like, okay, I have to like, we're going to do the whole thing. And we wound up doing um, the whole, uh, the whole movie. And that was great. So the last episode was the stylist and Hunter Hunter, which are both absolutely amazing awesome movies, movies and yeah. highly recommended. So yeah. Absolutely. And Scott, where can people find us? All right. So you, you can find uh, find Heather and I on our main uh, main show, which is the Friday Nightmares podcast. Uh, we are under the Kill the Cast banner on the Legion Podcast Network. On the Legion Podcast Network. Yes, of course, repping the show like she repping does. Repping the show. Uh, and uh, just like this show, uh, we are proud members of the Legion Podcast family. Uh, but there are also a couple other shows that we, uh, that we do. Um, there's the one, It's Not Horror, Okay, that me, Heather, Android from the Cemetery Gates podcast, uh, Nudie Lemoy, and uh, Mr. Venom himself. And we pick a random movie that's not horror and just commentate over it. And usually it's just nonsense and na just uh, making fun of the movie, making fun of each other. Shenanigans. Yes. Just shenanigans. It's basically just a bunch of friends getting together, having a good time. And then you also have another show that you do. So I have the Slumber Party Massacre that's done with Carly, Lacey, and Rebecca. We're actually going to be recording our next episode this week, and it's going to be dropping. This will be episode number three, and there'll be some pretty epic pillow fights. I am sure Sander is going to be ready for that feedback after this <laughs> most. It's going to oh, be yeah. on Final Guys, Sander. Ooh, I hope There's I win. like, yeah, it's actually all the podcasting. <laughs> honestly, Cinder, I would probably put my money on you. <laughs> no, probably because the end, Scott, you and I would die. I mean, I, I managed to talk to, about this. <laughs> I managed to wrangle in Android virus, so like anyone that can, oh, that's true. Get <laughs> Android, even Mike knows Android. Like everyone knows Android. Anyone can get Android <laughs> to be somewhat like not offensive is incredible. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> like, anyway, um, and I guess that's it. Should I just see us out, Scott, or is there anything else you wanted to add? Uh, nope, that was it. So yeah, if you want to close out the show. All right. So controllers down, cards up, power off, and we'll see you next time. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye. Thanks for having me.